Welcome to um, your next lecture. We made it through the first one, now we're doing the second one. Uh, today's lecture is on the Great Depression, so make sure that once again you have gone into uh, Canvas and you have downloaded the Great Depression PowerPoint and you have it you know, over there somewhere uh, and you're ready to go back and forth. Uh, hopefully today will um, be slightly smoother. I'm going to try to not do ums so much, but I think that that's very difficult and I think that I probably use them in the classroom too, so it shouldn't be anything that you're not kind of already familiar with. So let's get started. Today we're going to talk about the Great Depression, and there's nothing really uh, happy about the Great Depression, but we're going to dive right in, we're going to tackle it, uh, we're going to um, kind of ex explore this topic together a little bit, and sadly, it might prove to be beneficial to what's happening in the world around us right now. We're seeing the stock market plummet, we're seeing all sorts of uh, economical uh, repercussions to this COVID-19, so maybe studying the Great Depression will give us some insight into that. So your words of importance today are the Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the CIO. Again, that's going to be on your PowerPoint, so you shouldn't have to worry about it too much. Uh, the uh, Keynesianism, again, on your PowerPoint, so I'm not going to spell it out. The Wagner Act and the Social Security Act. Those are all hot button words that you guys should be familiar with when we're done with this unit or this chapter. Okay, so let's get started. Causes. Uh, historians can't really agree exactly on what caused the Great Depression. It's more like there's a whole lot of symptoms that added up and created this Great Depression. A lot of people like to just say it was the stock market crash, like boom, bam, done, stock market crash, had to cause the Great Depression. But by and large, that's not the general consensus. There's lots of things that are happening during this time. You've got buying on margin. We'll explain what that is. Buying on margin was basically where people were financing stocks. So what they started doing is a person could go into a stockbroker and they could say, hey, I have $10 that I want to put on GE stock, um, but I want to finance another 15 And so basically... They would do that, so they would borrow 15 from the stockbroker. They would then be investing $25, and when the stock rose, they would sell off. The uh, stockbroker would take back the money they had you know, put in there plus interest, and then the uh, original purchaser you know, could either reinvest or refinance or finance at a higher number. So basically, buying on margin is the financing of stocks. Um, there was also stock manipulation, there was insider training, and the U.S. had a huge stock bubble, a very big stock bubble. And if you study history economically, then um, it's very obvious that there are these patterns of, of rising bubbles and then bursting. Uh, it, it happened in the British Empire, it's happened throughout all of history. And for the United States, they had a stock market bubble in the 1920s. Um, and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And like bubble gum, anytime, like you can't have an infinite bubble, right? We all know this. I think um, we've all at some point tried this too, where you just want the biggest bubble possible when you're blowing bubbles with your bubble yum. Um, but we all know the eventual outcome of bubble blowing, and that is that it is going to absolutely pop. And so... The stock market does that in the United States in 1929. It pops. And there is a drastic ripple effect. Um, there, from 1929 to 1932, stocks lost more than 100% of the value they had gained during the 20s. All wealth is measured um, by, like, the stock wipeout. Uh, with it went investments. Um, example, savings banks, um, losing people's savings, all of these are tied up into this stock market uh, crash. And 
um, when all of this started happening and, and all of these dominoes started falling in the economic collapse that happens in 1929 and 1930, um, it, it, it is definitely a domino effect. And so if you have a savings bank or if you have any financial institution that you have um, that has loaned you money or that has taken your money and invested it, uh, when it crashes, they just close their doors. So if you have money in a postal, in, in a savings bank of any kind, mm -hmm. then um, what's going to happen is if that bank is forced to close its doors, you just lose your money. You lose whatever you had invested. You lose the savings you had with them. You lose everything. And so that's what starts happening. You have these bank runs and you have these banks that are closing. They can't keep their doors open because as people are panicking, uh, someone might walk in. If, if I had, you know, $1,000 at Chase Bank and I had uh, put $1,000 into an account at Chase and I had taken my money into Chase and given it to them and opened this account, then, um, and I start hearing that banks aren't safe and that money is, um, you know, that everything is, is plummeting, then I might panic and go to Chase and say, I, I want to withdraw my, my $1,000. But do they still have the cash that I brought in originally to open my account? Absolutely not. Because what banks do is they take in money and then they give out money. So if I take them $1,000 in cash and you come in and apply for a home loan or an auto loan or a farm loan, part of my money goes to um, that loan. Like that's how all of that works. It's a business. And so if I go in and demand my thousand dollars in cash, they might not have it. And so banks were closing because they just didn't have any more money to give out. And so as there were runs on banks and as people were trying to uh, collect their money, it's causing more of a panic and it's causing more things to um, collapse. And people are losing their farms, they're losing their homes, they're losing their businesses. Uh, all of this starts kind of spiraling. And production collapses as well. Uh, production collapses. And so what starts happening is as soon as sales go down and production slows, then you have um, businesses that are going to start laying people off. And so you're going to have massive layoffs. You're going to have a constriction of production, which is then going to cause more people to lose jobs, which is then going to cause uh, more people to not be able to buy things. And it's going to just be this snowball of problems that's going to happen. By 1932, the unemployment rate is close to 25% nationally, which is absolutely unprecedented. One out of four workers are unable to actually work during the Great Depression. In 2009 to 2010, the worst part of the economic crisis in recent history, um, unemployment peaked at around 9%, and that was considered catastrophic. So just imagine what 25% un unemployment looked like. Those with jobs are working less hours. They're working for smaller wages. Um, they're experiencing their pay being cut fairly dramatically. By 1933, a third of all banks had failed. And at this point, banks are not insured. So like I already said, when a bank closes, you just lose all of your money. By 1930, one half of all textile workers are unemployed. Uh, even Ford Motor Company, they were forced to lay off 72% of their employees in 1931, or 130,000. Uh, and so all of the welfare capitalism that we talked about in that very optimistic 1920s lecture, uh, that's, that's just gone. It's done. That's not going to be a thing anymore. Um, the New York garment industry, uh, by 1932 had a 90% unemployment rate. So different areas were hit in different ways and some of them were hit worse than others. Uh, but, I mean, you've got to understand that in the midst of disaster, in the midst of economic ruin, when people can't make their 
rent payments or their mortgage payments or they can't afford to buy enough food, they're definitely not buying clothes. And so the clothes industry was hit very, very hard during the Great Depression. When you look at Harlem, in Harlem by 1932, they had an 80% uh, unemployment rate. So 80% of heads of household were unemployed in 1932. African Americans are going to be the first to uh, the first to get fired. They are the last to get hired. Lots of areas that were booming are now devastated. And as if that wasn't enough, you also have an environmental crisis. And you guys, because of where we're located, uh, in Texas on the border of Oklahoma, you guys might be fairly familiar with some of these concepts like the Dust Bowl. But the Dust Bowl is a thing. <clears throat> the Dust Bowl was a several year drought that was um, that centered around the depletion of soil. It was massive dust storms that uh, slowly ate away the topsoil. And so everything that maybe had been fertile, where people were growing things, all of that is going to um, become very arid, very dry. There's truly these big, huge dust storms and all that fertile soil when it's happening, it just gets blown away. And that means that farmers can't plant. It means that um, agriculture is going to take a massive, massive hit. Uh, and since most farmers still work in a debt system, that means foreclosures on their farms. So Texas, New Mexico, Kansas, Oklahoma, they're all hit very hard by the Dust Bowl. And we talked about that. We talked about the system of debt for farmers, how most, if you're an individual farmer, then you're forced to take out loans to uh, prepare for the harvest. And then you use the harvest to pay back the loans and to procure any money. But unfortunately, if um, if uh, you can't make a harvest because uh, of the dust storms and if you're not able to uh, to get that done, then you, you are going to fall even farther in debt and it is this vicious cycle. So because of the Dust Bowl, 2.5 million farmers are going to be displaced. Uh, this is where the term Okies comes from, which is kind of weird and there's this odd misconception that it only affected people in Oklahoma but that's absolutely not true I already listed several states that this was a problem in, and it continued to be a problem for a lot of people in the south so the president has to respond right and Herbert Hoover is the president uh, during this the beginning of this economic disaster and crisis um, and this is, he was a Republican, and so this is kind of when we begin to see the transition of the Republican Party. It had been a party uh, to, that believed in a, a large role of, of government in the economy. So um, the Republicans originally really believed that a big government and lots of money in the government and lots of government programs were the way to go. Uh, but this starts to change and we see that with Herbert Hoover. Uh, Hoover thought very differently. He, he really believed that the government shouldn't intervene in the economy. He thought that the government should be separate from the economy and that they should have no say over it. And so when all of these things start happening, when the bank runs and the closer, closures and the restrictions, the restriction of wages, and when all of this starts to fall apart, um, Hoover thinks that you have to just leave it alone, that you have to just do nothing, and that the market is self-correcting and that the market will fix itself. Uh, and some of the stuff he said was at best very questionable. He blamed unemployment in the South on Mexican workers, which led to the Mexican Repatriation Act, which um, coerced Mexicans to return to Mexico. It pretty much gave them no choice. And we're sh not sure to this day 
how many Mexicans were forced to return to Mexico, but we believe it was at least 500,000 Mexicans were forced back into Mexico. But that was the initial uh, reason that Hoover said that unemployment was so bad was because Mexicans had come in and taken all of the jobs. And so he pushed a lot of Mexicans to, to repatriate back to Mexico. Um, most were coerced, not officially deported. At least 200,000 U.S.-born children of Mexicans were forced to go back to Mexico. Um, and again, these are children that were born in the United States that had grown up in the United States. And so you see U.S.-born, U.S. citizens being expelled from the country. And there's no legal way to expel U.S. born from the U.S., but they did it anyway. In 1930, you have the Smoot-Hawley Tariff, and it imposes high importation taxes to protect U.S. businesses and to uh, eliminate competition for U.S. products. So they raised the tariff to 50%. And that did not have the desired effect. So, because what did other countries do in response? So, the United States put a 50% import tax on goods from Europe. And so, Europe turns around and uh, does the same thing. They raise taxes on U.S. goods. And uh, it vastly undercut international commerce to hurt the U.S. export business. Uh, 1932, Herbert Hoover's running for re-election, and he finally decides that he has to do something. So, he established an unprecedented federal loan and public works project, creating infrastructure jobs. And um, he is widely, however, blamed for the ongoing depression and blamed for doing almost nothing to help U.S. citizens during this time of economic crisis. There are, in fact, an extremely large number of homeless American citizens that are starting to form these homeless camps throughout the United States, and they became known as uh, Hoovervilles. So any of these homeless um, homeless camps uh, were called Hoovervilles and they were places where people who had lost their homes due to the depression gathered and just tried to survive. Uh, and the first several years the government really was doing very little and so what happens is they do begin to take action for themselves. Um, organizations pop up across the country, unemployment councils, uh, they uh, hold protest demonstrations demanding the government take action, demanding that the government create jobs, that they organize and, and that they organize and help. Um, and so as the Great Depression spreads and as the government continues to ignore the needs of American citizens during this time and refuse to step in and do anything to help, what you see is a whole mutual aid movement spread dramatically across the United States and try to help fellow Americans. Uh, you see shared housing, soup kitchens, and something called flying squads. They all go to help. Uh, and the flying squads are probably one of my favorite uh, aspects of the Great Depression because what it was was a group of people who got together to help prevent evictions. So whenever they hear that someone's been given an eviction notice, then you have these unemployed people who all show up, some of, sometimes as many as 2,000 of them, and they put the furniture that is being removed from the homes back in the homes. They intimidate the sheriff. They intimidate the evictors. They line up, and they don't allow the people to be removed from their homes. They prevented 77,000 evictions in New York City alone. That is very impressive and one of, again, my favorite things about teaching the Great Depression is I love talking about these flying squads. You also have these flying squads of unemployed men who tap into electric uh, mines illegally, who do illegal plumbing, and who um, 
get together and help people maintain their electricity and plumbing without paying for it. Um, because you've got to remember, unemployment had caused all sorts of workers to lose their jobs. So it's not just factory workers that aren't working during this time. What you see is skilled laborers, electricians, plumbers, all of these people that are losing their jobs. And so a lot of them will band together and go and hook up um, electric electrical lines, hook up plumbing lines, turn on water, because they know how to do these things. And so they, they work to uh, bring these services to their communities for no charge. And all of this is going to be organized by political radicals. You have the IWW, which we already talked about. You have socialists, communists, anarchists, all joining together to make sure people have somewhere to live, food to eat, and electricity and water inside of their homes. You also have the Catholic Worker Movement during this time. It's organized in 1933 by Dorothy Day. It's a Catholic pacifist anarchist movement. Uh, devout Catholics who believe in pacifist, pacifism will help their neighbors and they won't rely on the government. And they will uh, voluntarily embrace poverty based on Christ. And their whole uh, devoted mission will be to help one another. You have houses of hospitality form where uh, the unemployed can sleep and get a hot meal. And many of those exist today in Denton and in Dallas and in different places across the United States. You have military veterans who are uniting and demanding that they be given their uh, bonuses because they were all promised these bonus certificates whenever they fought in World War I. And now the government is refusing to honor them because they say they can't. And so you have the bonus march. And this is one of those times where I need you to pause the lecture. And I need you to go into the PowerPoint and watch the video on the bonus marchers. Um, if you can't find it on the PowerPoint, then you can Google the bonus marchers. And you should be able to watch it. But the PowerPoint uh, presentation should have everything that you need again. In 1934, there's a massive strike wave. Uh, it is organized in the face of decreased wages. It is the largest strike wave to date. Millions participate. There are over 2,000 strikes nationwide in 1934. You have them on the San Francisco waterfront, the Toledo auto strike, the Minneapolis Teamster strike. You have textile strikes. Strikes are spreading all across the country. And... Um, usually a depression would be a terrible time to go on strike. And, you know, they would work better when the economy is better. But workers were desperate. Workers were very desperate because they're losing their jobs and they don't have, um, there, there's no jobs to find and they have nothing to lose. And so they're going to strike even if it's not the most advantageous time. You have rank and file workers. Um telling them don't strike, but many of the strikes were successful, uh, such as in San Francisco. Uh, they succeeded in unionizing the longshoremen in 1935. You have the formation of the CIO. Uh, it was initially part of the AFL, so it was the AFL-CIO. Um, they are urging a much more militant approach and in 1938, the CIO comes into its own independent labor union, and it has 4 million members. And um, it's significant because it is an all-inclusive militant union. It is a major American union open to and actively recruiting all workers, African Americans, women, minorities, um, most most unions were very conservative. They covered skilled white laborers, but the CIO uh, covered everyone and they were willing to strike. But unlike the IWW, they didn't want an anti-capitalist society. Like the IWW wanted to tear down capitalism completely and the CIO, uh, that was not on their agenda. They didn't call for the overthrow of capitalism. They just wanted everyone to get better wages. And so there's this whole upsurge from below uh, when you look at the context of the 1932 election, which is Hoover against FDR, who is a Democrat and governor of New York. 
He is a distant cousin to Teddy Roosevelt, um, who is a Republican, but he is only a distant cousin, not like a close relation. And so what he does is FDR comes in and he promises a new deal for the U.S. He never really explains that new deal, though, because he doesn't know what it is yet. In fact, major, there's no major concrete policy. Uh, it's all kind of um, open and blank, and no one's quite sure what is going to happen. But he does say that he will repeal prohibition, which is really big, and he does. And really, FDR just isn't Hoover. And that's all it took in this election was you just couldn't be Hoover because people were tired of Hoover. They were starving. They were unemployed, and they felt like the government had left them out to dry, and so they wanted someone who was not Hoover. Uh, so really, FDR just slaughters Hoover in the election. So FDR is president, and he inherited a, wor a worse economic crisis, the worst economic crisis in U.S. history. So he's president, so now what does he do? And so he has all these economic advisors. He has all these different people in place to help him decide what the best thing is to do. And there's two uh, very different strains of economic thought that are happening at the time. And that's the two main economic theorists are Maynard Keynes and uh, Hayek. And so again, pause, press pause on me and go to the PowerPoint and watch the really horrible rap battle that is Keynes versus Hayek. I warn you, it's extremely cheesy but it explains it far better than I could, and you at least get some catchy uh, catchy sounds to work with um, instead of just listening to me for a minute. So pause it, go do it, come back in a second. Okay, so you should be back. You should have watched that horrible rap battle. And now we can talk about Keynesianism. Uh, sometimes what, what he believes is that sometimes government uh, in, interaction is good, and sometimes it's needed. And they're all about the stimulus. And so with Keynes, he believes that deficit spending is good. It's good for the market. It's good to uh, help the economy. And then you have Hayek, who opposes government intervention in the economy and insisted that um, private is superior and that the government should do nothing, that the government would lead to serfdom and that it would lead to totalitarianism. And so those are your two big economic uh, theories at the time. And so FDR is faced with this. He has to pick how's he gonna handle this. Is he gonna continue what Hoover was doing uh, with Hayek's basic idea that government shouldn't interfere in the private market? Or is he going to follow a more Keynesian approach? And so FDR assembled a team of advisors, a brain trust, and they are more persuaded by Keynesianism. Keynesianism. That is a hard word to say, folks. And so uh, he looks at Hoover's lack of help, and he, he really believes that it didn't work. And so even though he doesn't have an overriding general theory or strategy behind his New Deal, he begins to start getting this uh, rolled out. He is willing to try anything. And so the FDR legislation is uh, designed to really tackle the depression. And it's based on three R's. Um, and those are relief, recovery, and reform. So relief. So let's get money in the pockets of American citizens. Let's get them uh, relief. They need money. They need food. They need shelter. They need jobs. So let's give them relief. Let's recover. Let's get the market to recover. Let's get the economy to recover. And then let's pass laws that keep this from ever happening again. <coughs> Those are the big things that are important. And so they've got to have some sort of immediate relief for everyone who is suffering. They've got to figure out how to turn around the economy, and they've got to create long-term changes to prevent future depressions. So you get the first New Deal. There's two. You get the first New Deal from 1933 to 1935, and um, FDR introduces 
a lot of new programs and agencies, and there's lots of acronyms, and be thankful I am not going to ask you to memorize any of these or really get detailed information on any of these uh, because there are so many of them. There are so many, but he creates all these different agencies and all these different programs, and he throws them all out there so he can see what's going to work. The most important ones are the creation of the uh, of the FDIC. The FDIC is very important. It's still important today. And what that does is it promises every American citizen that if they put their money in a bank, it is protected. It is a government-backed insurance program um, that says that absolutely, if you put a thousand dollars in Chase Bank, no matter what, your thousand dollars is guaranteed and safe. That's extremely important. You also have government-backed insurance programs for um, housing. So you have the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, is going to be created. Also something that's pretty big still today. You are also going to have the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA, and that's a huge, expansive law. You can read about it in your book. I suggest you do so. Uh, and one thing that it did was it was the first time you have federal legislation explicitly um, recognizing the rights of employees to join the union. Up until then, union existed, ex unions existed in this kind of crazy no man's land where there were no actual laws. And so what happens with this, with this uh, NIRA is it guarantees the right of Americans to join unions and it helped spur the organization efforts of the CIO and the AFL because they had legitimacy now. Now they have laws backing their right to exist. And some went further and said that the president wants you to join unions. They used this act and the president's supporting of this act to really promote the growth of unions. There are other acts as well designed to help farmers and to help those that are unemployed. In 1935, though, disaster strikes. All these laws are challenged in the courts as unconstitutional. And unfortunately, there is a very conservative Supreme Court at the time. The Constitution um, gives Congress the right to monitor interstate commerce, but the Supreme Court strikes down large parts of FDR's New Deal the NRA, many of the centerpieces of the New Deal, which in turn means the economy starts tanking again. So when he passed the first New Deal, uh, the economy started like like climbing back up. It was like Thomas the Train, and it was like choo-chooing back onto the right track. And then uh, the Supreme Court comes in and says, no, actually, um, the government doesn't have the right to do any of this. They can't constitutionally do any of this. And so as soon as they mark these things as unconstitutional and strike them down, then the economy goes, again, right into the tank. And so <coughs> um, during the Depression, FDR really makes a lot of wild moves. Since the Supreme Court was ruling against them, he has this great idea that he's going to expand the Supreme Court by five more judges, which he will appoint himself and which will give him the majority so they can't do this. In 1937, uh, he tries to do this and it's called court packing, but it doesn't happen. It's completely struck down uh, by Congress and the rest of the government. But eventually, the Supreme Court does begin to uphold New Deal programs uh, by adopting a, a stream of commerce doctrine justifying Congress's right to regulate wages, hours, and etc., um, which produce things that do uh, enter into interstate commerce. And so by making these changes and allowing them, uh, parts of the New Deal start to work more effectively. FDR passes new laws um, and you know all of that so you have the first new deal and you have the second new deal and the second new deal has a whole lot of new acronyms and a whole lot of um, out I, I call it alphabet soup because there's just so many you have the WPA though which is the works progress administration the WPA the works progress administration and that one's extremely important 
um, the government attempted to create jobs for the unemployed. And so uh, they're creating about two to three million per year. And they're doing anything and everything they could come up with in order to create these jobs. And again, you can press pause and go watch the WPA video in the PowerPoint. I suggest that you do so. All right, so now that you've watched that, you can see a little bit. You don't have to watch the whole video, by the way, but if you did, then that's good. And so what you watched was a New Deal promotional video. That was a video created and shown in movie theaters to really get the hype up for the WPA. And one of the best things to come out of the WPA was the oral histories that they did. And so the WPA hired and paid people to go around the country and interview all of the slave, former slaves who were still alive. And those slave narratives are cataloged in the Library of Congress, and they have been an absolutely crucial asset to historians of this country in reconstructing what slavery was actually like. Another thing that the WPA did was work was a parks. They created a lot of parks. Um, the free market during the Great Depression was not providing employment. They were not um, stepping in and taking care of the U.S. And, and citizens and providing jobs. And so absolutely the government stepped in and provided some work for Americans. You also have the Fair Labor Standard, Standards Act. It is a federal minimum wage and a national work week. So people now work eight hour work days. In 1935, you have the Wagner Act, which is the backing of the CIO and AFL. It guaranteed, um, it guaranteed workers the right to unionize and it bans unfair labor practices. Like you can't be fired for organizing, you can't be fired for joining a union. Those things are very important. I also established the National Labor Board, which will make decisions about what is an unfair labor practice. The National Labor Board uh, also oversees joining unions. Now workplaces vote for unions instead of striking. And that becomes significant policy and um, you will see a spike in labor union membership. You have 9 million workers and 25, like 25%, 25 one out of every four of them are uh, going to join uh, unions. And that's going to, to be important during that time. The CIO uh, sex successfully organizes a, a it successfully organizes the steel industry and the auto industry. And they pioneer sit-down strikes, which means they lock themselves in the workplace and refuse to leave. And it's very effective, extremely effective. But it's also deemed illegal to do so. Uh, you have... Um, Memorial Day of 1937. That's another video. I want you to pause and uh, watch that and, and see what happens. Okay, so you also have in 1935 the Social Security Act, the AFDC is created, uh, aid for dependent children, unemployment insurance is created, disability insurance, retirement ins insurance, or what we know as Social Security. All of those things are created with the Social Security Act. Um, and there's benefits. A mandatory retirement insurance plan is created. It helps people to retire. Um, and remarkably, FDR does uh, all of this spending with very little deficit. He never runs over a 5% deficit, which is absolutely unbelievable when we look at modern economics. He is able to pay more than 90% of the cost of the programs up front. And he pays up front the enormous cost of these. And he does it through taxes. And he does it through taxes on the wealthiest incomes. <coughs> incomes of 70 to 80 million a year you were forced to pay 80% taxes on 
But what you have to remember is that if you made $80 million and you're taxed at 80%, you're still taking home about $14 million a year, which is a lot of money. And so today, a lot of people get caught up on these ideas that if we tax these billionaires, you know, 80, 70 to 80% of their income, that they're going to go broke and that they're not going to stay in business. But that's absolutely not true. If someone makes $11 billion and you tax them at 90%, they're still going to make a billion dollars a year, uh, which is quite enough money for anyone to survive off of. But during these times, FDR will start it. It'll continue through the 50s, uh, which we'll talk about next week. These programs uh, very much uh, survived and were successful because they took tax dollars from these very, very wealthy Americans, and it helped the economy. It did not hurt it. Uh, FDR enjoys a huge voting base. The American public loves FDR. Uh, the government, the financial moguls, the billionaires, they hated FDR. But the people absolutely loved him. He was voted in four times. In fact, they'll change the law after he's elected his fourth time. He dies in office during his fourth term. But they will actually change the law so that presidents can't be elected four times. Um, but he, he does have this huge voting base that's known as the New Deal Coalition. And you have long time... Uh, Democratic voters like farmers, um, you have ethnic minorities, you have religious minorities, you have labor unions. Um, all of these groups are Democrats that are going to come out and, and vote for him. And he's going to get new Democratic voters that never voted Democratic before. And those are progressives and African Americans. And they're going to all join together and vote for this man. And he's unbeatable. He's absolutely unbeatable. Um, they, no one can, can do it. Um, but the New Deal, unfortunately, didn't help everyone equally. Women, um, most jobs are only open to the head of household. And all the government jobs that are created are created for men. And so single women are really left to suffer during this time period. Uh, also, domestic servants were include, excluded from any of the uh, labor acts that were passed, any of the laws like the Wagner Act and all of those uh, laws were excluded from, um, you know, excluded domestic servants, which was a large job, you know, one of the biggest jobs for women. And so they don't have max hours, they don't have a minimum wage. And so you will see that for most women, they are not going to be helped a whole lot by the New Deal. Uh, African Americans, in part, are excluded by design and they're impacted more than whites. But because um, but because the FDR coalition relied on Southern whites, uh, congressmen ensured that most African Americans were excluded from the New Deal. Uh, they were they were upholding Jim Crow laws. Uh, in exchange for votes. I hope that that makes sense. Uh, the most frustrating part of doing these lectures like this is I feel that if there's parts that aren't clear to you guys, I don't know and I can't reach out and help you. I can't, you know, pause for questions. I can't allow you guys to interact and that really bothers me. So I hope that you'll take initiative and if at any time you have questions about the lecture, or questions about any of the material that I'm presenting, I hope that you'll reach out to me. Um, I'm going to be checking my email a lot now that this has gone to an online format. And so um, one of the things I would recommend is that if at any point during lecture, you know, keep a notepad by you, you know, take notes like you normally would, but also write down questions. If you're like, man, I didn't understand that. Write down a question, email it to me at the end, email me all your questions and I can answer them and get with you. We can also set up conferences through Canvas or through uh, Microsoft Teams where we can speak uh, virtually. 
And we can, you know, like, it's like a Skype, basically. And so we can do all of these things to help you. So I just thought I would address that as we were moving on, because some of the stuff can get complicated and kind of tricky. And if you don't get it, then I want you to reach out to me because I want to make sure that you do get the material that I am presenting. Okay, so back to this. Um, agriculture was also excluded from a lot of these laws that were passed, like the Wagner Act. And FDR made that compromise to get the acts passed. Uh, aid programs, administrations at state levels, uh, you know, they're, for the South, that's going to bar African Americans, and they're going to overwhelmingly turn them away. So what FDR does is he passes these acts, but he... Uh, gives control of the acts to each individual state. So uh, all the aid programs, all of the things that he does, they're controlled on a state level. So in the South, what that means is it allows the South to exclude African Americans from participating in the aid programs. And they are overwhelmingly turned away. And the FHA also made it almost impossible uh, for African Americans to acquire FHA loans. Uh, so the housing boom that happens because of the Fair Housing Administration that's created is going to be exclusively white. Also in 1937, the NFL bans black players. It had been integrated. And then at the insistence of the Washington Redskins, uh, they do segregate it. There are efforts to pass anti-lynching laws. Um, and they are blocked by Southern Democrats. I think we finally, finally, this year, 2020, I think they finally passed a federal anti-lynching law. But it took them, I think, 200 years to, to do this. Um, FDR didn't back legislation which caused fighting with Eleanor his wife so there's all these efforts on both parts you have efforts from the southern politicians to squash rights for African Americans and then you have other efforts of uh, Congress to pass laws to help protect African Americans and FDR it is his biggest downfall is he did not do a whole lot to protect African Americans. And his wife, Eleanor, was a big, big proponent of equality and racial equality. So uh, it's said that that actually led to quite a few personal fights with his wife. Uh, Mexican Americans are excluded from these new uh, helpful programs as well, and repa repatriation continued under FDR. Um, And so the New Deal in its entirety failed to accomplish, you know, all of the main goals. It didn't end the Depression, but it did help ease suffering. Um, but its main goal was to end the Great Depression and to keep it from ever happening again. And it didn't really manage that. What did end the Great Depression was World War II, which we're going to spend next week talking about. Uh, but there is a big legacy of the New Deal and FDR, and that's the Social Security Act. That is creating um, social nets for American citizens in times of disaster and hardship and, and trials and tribulations. So the New Deal has you know, a long-standing importance to American citizens. It opens up, like I said, and creates avenues of welfare to help uh, to help to help Americans when they're suffering. And it's important to understand that we hear a lot of negativity about welfare, but it's it's very very small percentages of uh, the United States. Only one point four percent of the population apply. Uh, applies for and is approved for any sort of welfare, and one half of 1% of federal spending is spent on welfare. Uh, and unemployment insurance only accounts for 1.5% of the population. So, I mean, in all, uh, 
not a whole lot of our our money goes to helping these people uh and that's that's important um and unfortunately the federal government ends up using the social security fund as kind of their own trust fund and they'll spend a whole lot of it and that's why we have so many debates today on what to do about social security and so many people are trying to cut social security and so many people want to do away with social security or they say that it's out of money but it's only out of money because the government decided to use it all that's just honest facts and so that's still going to be a big uh center of debate for years to come as we figure out what to do with aging people who are transitioning to retirement and the government still hasn't replaced all of the money that it spent out of the social security fund so that's what we have for today yay um i'm thinking about making props and and having whiteboards and different things to try to get your attention while i'm going through these lectures but we'll see what happens um thank you for watching continue to watch. It's absolutely important. Uh, I, I'm, hopefully we'll get back to school, but I'm just not optimistic that we'll return to a classroom setting this year. Uh, but we'll see what happens. So stay positive, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll talk about World War II next time.